You're listening to Talking Freely, where we discuss culture, politics, and religious freedom. Talking Freely is a podcast from Freedom for Faith, a Christian legal think tank that exists to protect and promote religious freedom in Australia. Welcome to Talking Freely. My name is Rowan McHugh. My guest today is Nicola Cerrone, who is Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Queensland. He has had visiting positions at Oxford, Cambridge, Paris, Edinburgh, Durham, Sydney, Emory and Tilburg universities. Professor Aroni has published over 100 journal articles, book chapters and books in the fields of constitutional law, comparative constitutional law and legal theory. In 2017, he was appointed by the Australian Prime Minister to an expert panel to advise on whether Australian law adequately protects the human right to freedom of religion. This is now known as the Ruddock Review. Professor Aroni, thanks for your time today. Real pre- pleasure to be here with you, Rowan. The panel of the Ruddock Review issued a report containing 20 recommendations for the government. Can you talk about why the review was necessary and touch on which recommendations you consider most important to ensuring genuine religious freedom? Well, Rowan, there's a long history to the Ruddock Review because the question of religious freedom has been something that has been a matter of public debate and inquiry in Australia for a couple of decades now. Uh, But it came to a head, of course, after the the postal survey on the question about whether same-sex marriage should be recognised, because that interfaced with uh, religious perspectives about marriage and questions about whether religious freedom would be affected by a change to our national understanding of what marriage is. So in a sense, that was a catalyst that raised the question to public prominence. But before that, there'd been a lot of people thinking about and asking questions about whether freedom of religion is adequately protected under Australian law. Uh, Now, that's a very broad question, uh, but the very specific way in which it manifests in Australia at the moment has a lot to do with anti-discrimination laws, which are laws that prohibit people and organisations from discriminating against other people on various grounds in a whole range of fields of public life, like in government, uh, in employment, in education and in the provision of uh, accommodation and some other areas like that. And it's unlawful to discriminate under state, territory and federal laws in those sorts of areas on a whole range of grounds like discrimination on the basis of race or sex or gender or sexuality or religion itself, as well as, in some instances, nationality uh, and even political opinion. Uh, So the point of these laws is to make it unlawful to discriminate on those grounds so that people can participate in those areas of public life without being discriminated against. Uh, But it's recognised that some sorts of organisations need to be able to uh, be selective, say, for example, when they employ people in order to preserve the identity of the organisation. An obvious example would be a political organisation, say a political party, uh, which adheres to a particular platform or a particular set of philosophical and political beliefs. Uh, To participate in such an organisation one can understand why the organisation requires people to adhere to uh, the political beliefs of the political party to which they want to become a member. Um, And so the same is often the case with religious organisations as well. Uh, To be a member of a religion is to adhere to that religion. And so it's understandable that uh, religious organisations need to be able to maintain their identity uh, by ensuring that their membership consists of people that belong to that religion. Um, So those two, that creates two sides to a coin, Rowan, because what it means is on one hand, we have laws that make it unlawful to discriminate on the basis of, say, political belief or religious belief. But on the other hand, we recognise that political organisations or religious organisations need to be able to uh, maintain their identity by distinguishing between people who hold to their political or religious beliefs as members and those who do not. Uh, And so there's a a tension built into anti-discrimination laws 
insofar as it's recognised that they need to try to achieve both things at the same time. And that's where one of the central issues uh, emerges. Much attention was given to the Religious Discrimination Bill last year, which is waiting to return to government business. A related piece of legislation is the Sex Discrimination Act, which has exemptions built into it for religious bodies. An example of that is religious schools who are exempt in order to employ staff that adhere to their religious standards and further their religious ethos. During your time on the Ruddock Review panel, what did you learn about the efficacy of this exemption arrangement to protect religious freedom? Uh, a very interesting question. Uh, I, I think one of the things I learned most from the process was the engagement with such a wide variety of points of view around the balance to be struck between uh, anti-discrimination norms on one hand and the ability of organisations to maintain their, their identity on the other. And uh, we heard from people from all over the political spectrum and people from a variety of points of view around that tension. So we heard from people who were strongly in favour of the view that the anti-discrimination norms should prevail in almost all circumstances. And we heard from people who said that on the other hand, uh, the norms of the uh, organisation itself should be protected and its capacity to maintain its identity could be maintained in that respect. Um, and so there are exemptions and exceptions contained in, in anti-discrimination laws in order to maintain the balance. And you've referred to one particular form of uh, exemption. Um, it's worth putting those sorts of exemptions into context uh, because, for example, the Sex Discrimination Act, which is a federal law uh, in Section 37, uh, provides exemptions for religious organisations in relation to the ordination of priests and ministers, the training of priests and ministers, the, the appointment of persons to perform religious observances, as well as a much broader uh, exemption, which is in these terms, any other act or practice of a religious body that conforms to the doctrines, tenets or beliefs of the religion or is necessary to avoid injury to the religious susceptibilities of adherence of that religion, which is a broad category of exemption, but defined specifically by reference to the particular doctrines, tenets or beliefs of the religion or the religious susceptibilities of adherence of the religion. So we have those sorts of uh, exemptions in place um, in, in that context. But we then also, in Section 38, have more specific uh, exemptions in respect of particular types of discrimination in particular areas. So I mentioned at the beginning that anti-discrimination laws single out particular fields of public life in which one is not allowed to discriminate. One of them is employment, another is in education. And so, for example, Section 38.3 of the Sex Discrimination says that it's not unlawful to discriminate or to draw a distinction uh, between persons on the ground of a person's sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital or relationship status or pregnancy in connection with the provision of education by an educational institution conducted in accordance with its religious doctrines, provided that you discriminate in good faith in order to avoid injury to the religious susceptibilities of adherence of that religion. Now, what I've just said must sound quite complicated and complex. Uh, this is because the legislation is trying to address uh, a very difficult balancing act in determining the scope of those exemptions. Um, but that's a very important exemption to enable religious organisations to maintain um, their view that on matters of, say, sexual ethics, uh, particular sorts of practices are deemed, according to a religion, to be not part of the religious practices of that religion. Uh, but the exemption is carefully drafted so that it must only be the case, only occur where the educational institution is in fact conducted in accordance with the doctrines of the religion. And secondly, 
any discrimination that occurs is done in good faith, uh, genuinely because of those religious convictions, rather than putting up the religious convictions or religious statements as sort of a screen behind which other um, questionable motives are really driving um, the action to discriminate against somebody. Uh, so this, from what I'm trying to say here is there's a lot of complexity behind the law in relation to uh, these sorts of uh, questions that, um, that, that we have to struggle with when we ask ourselves, is religious freedom adequately protected? Um, another thing that's worth pointing out here is that when you think about the area of, say, education, it's not squarely seen by some people as something that's religious, um, particularly for those people who are not themselves religious in orientation. They may often tend to think that religion is about religious meetings in the specific sense of going to a temple, or going to a church or going to a synagogue or a mosque and attending a formal service of worship or a particular religious ceremony in that particular context. Uh, and that's seen as what religious practice is. Um, however, for the adherents of many religions, and here we can include all of the religions I've alluded to, Islam, Judaism and Christianity, for example, adherents of these religions also very deliberately establish educational institutions, particularly um, primary and secondary schools, where they offer education partly to adherents of their own religion, partly to people who might not adhere to the religion, but they establish the school in order to educate children in a manner that um, comports with their religious convictions. Um, and that is why the Sex Discrimination Act extends these protections to uh, the educational environment, because it's a recognition that uh, religious belief and practice is not just expressed in a temple or a synagogue, it also can be expressed in a religious school, providing education to children. In an article you wrote recently for The Conversation, you refer to the theory that religious freedom faces no significant threat in Western democracies and therefore doesn't need a religious discrimination bill put to parliament. You challenge that assertion by evoking a recent study by Israeli scholar Jonathan Fox. Could you help us through some of that study's revelations? Um, yeah, sure. I, it was a remarkable study. Uh, it was a landmark study that Professor Fox undertook. It involved surveying uh, the uh, situation in almost every country in the world. It was an international survey of unprecedented breadth and depth. And what it examined was the prevalence of forms of religious discrimination in uh, all of those countries. And it went about doing that in a very sophisticated way. Uh, one of the broad distinctions that the study drew was between government-backed religious discrimination and discrimination that occurs in a social context, a non-government context. So, for example, a government can discriminate on the basis of religion when it prohibits um, a religious organisation from uh, building a synagogue or a mosque or a church in a locality, not simply in order to preserve uh, the amenity of the, uh, the area or the locality according to neutral standards, but actually as a way of preventing the religion from exercising or the, the adherence of the religion for, to exercise their religious beliefs and construct a building in which they might uh, conduct their religious services. And of course, there are fine balancing acts that have to be uh, engaged in by local councils or other authorities to uh, apply local zoning rules. Um, so um, those lo local zoning rules can be perfectly legitimate and it can mean that it's not possible or appropriate to establish a religious building uh, in a particular locality because it's a, a residential area where there's nothing of that nature in the area. Uh, but in other contexts, sometimes, those sorts of rules can be used in a way that is discriminatory. 
and trying to exclude a religion or the people of a religion from establishing their buildings in uh, not just in a residential area, but in a fully commercial area or an area where it would be most appropriate to have religious buildings. So that's a form of government discrimination when it happens in that second sense, because you have government or state authority drawing distinctions on the basis of religion. Um, and that's a form of government sanctioned religious discrimination. You can also have socially based discrimination, which is when non-government actors in one way or another treat people badly because of their religion. Uh, it, that can be in the sorts of discrimination that we've been talking about in terms of the, the uh, say, the Sex Discrimination Act or, or um, laws that prohibit religious discrimination at a state level throughout Australia. Uh, so somebody, an employer, might discriminate by refusing to employ someone, um, say, um, to deliver pizzas because of their race or because of their religion or because of their political beliefs. Um, that sort of conduct would prima facie be unlawful under the anti-discrimination laws of the state. So that's a form of private discrimination that Professor Fox uh, was analysing across all of these countries uh, as well. Um, it, it can also be, um, as bad as that is, even more invidious when uh, it descends into forms of violence. Um, and so, unfortunately, uh, there are instances where, for example, uh, religious places of worship are uh, subjected to graffiti or vandalism, or uh, people of particular religions travelling on public transport uh, are treated uh, very poorly or badly or bullied um, or even physically coerced um, from time to time. Um, and those are forms of social discrimination uh, that occurs in, um, in countries as well. So John Fox was interested in understanding the prevalence of all of these types of discrimination. And he uh, developed a very, very sophisticated way of analysing all sorts of different types of discrimination that can occur in countries. The other thing that he did in his study was he distinguished between different countries according to the majority religion in the country and according to the political system prevailing in the country. And uh, this is where some very interesting results uh, started to emerge because he was able to compare the amount of discrimination that was occurring in countries that are majority Protestant, majority Catholic, majority Orthodox, majority Sunni Muslim, um, and so forth, um, majority Buddhist, and so on. And he was able to also look at the prevalence of discrimination in what might be called secular countries or modern liberal Western democracies, like the countries of Western Europe, like France, or like the United Kingdom, and like the United States or Canada, as well as Australia as well as to analyse the prevalence of religious discrimination in formerly communist countries like China, um, and also conditions throughout all the other countries of Asia. Some of them are communist, some of them are more liberal. Uh, and he also analysed South American countries uh, and African countries, and he did it in an even-handed way. He didn't place more weight on any particular category of country over another. He just laid out the data and presented how much discrimination, government-backed and socially-backed discrimination was occurring in each of these categories of country. And the remarkable thing that he found was that even though we here in a Western democracy have become accustomed to thinking that we are countries that are tolerant and that religious discrimination is, while it exists, is not very prevalent. Um, in fact, he found that certain forms of discrimination are actually more prevalent in Western liberal democracies than they are in several other countries that would not be described as either um, especially Western 
or even particularly liberal democracies. Um, these countries were very typically, interestingly enough, majority Christian countries of Africa and Asia, uh, Africa, sorry, and South America, where the incidence of, of discrimination on the basis of religion was in fact generally lower than uh, in some liberal democracies. Uh, the other thing that he found was that there are really big differences in the level of discrimination that occurs in majority Protestant, majority Catholic and majority Orthodox countries, as well as majority Muslim countries. And uh, he found that particularly in the last two categories, majority Christian Orthodox and majority Muslim, there were high levels of some forms of religious discrimination for religious reasons. And so it was a it's a very complex and nuanced picture that he came up with because he was able to classify the countries according to these broad categories, but he was also to, able to provide us with very specific data for every particular country. So under all of these categories, we can find in his book the levels of religious discrimination that are reported in Germany in particular, or Switzerland in particular, or Thailand in particular, or Burma in particular, and so forth across every country in the world. And so the point that I wanted to make in that paper that I wrote was that um, we here in Australia can easily fall into the trap of thinking that religious discrimination is not very common in our country, and therefore it's probably not necessary for us to have a Religious Discrimination Act at a federal level. Um, and the point that I was making was that this international study that benchmarks levels of religious discrimination across many countries points to vulnerabilities in Australia to religious discrimination that are greater than we would um, take for granted or assume to be the case uh, as a liberal democracy here in Australia. Some countries have decided that instead of attempting to accommodate religion in all its forms, it's easier to just prohibit religion in all public institutions like they do in France. Is this kind of neutrality possible in the public sphere? I think it's possible. The question is whether it is appropriate or just to do so. And, and what this draws attention to is that when we speak of a liberal democracy, we have to be very careful and recognize that countries that are liberal democracies can vary uh, and be quite different amongst themselves in relation to their attitudes to religious freedom and the expression of religion in public spaces or in public contexts. Um, so that it's possible to say that at the far end of the spectrum, you can have countries that are profoundly secular in an official way and I think the Soviet Union um, and even modern China tend towards this, and particularly North Korea, where the official position of the state is one of state atheism, and that uh, the resources of the state are devoted to the uh, encouragement through education and through law to um, forming a population that actually does not have religious belief or faith at all. Um, against that, countries like France certainly do uh, protect and respect religious freedom and don't attempt to, uh, in, a, in a radical way, discourage uh, religious observance in the private sphere of people's personal lives, family lives, and, and uh, religious lives in the narrow sense. However, they can adopt uh, restrictive views about the public expression of religion or the use of religious uh, thinking or beliefs in public spaces or in public discourse. And so there is a, a tendency in a country like France to maintain that uh, the public nature of the, the country or the nation is defined by essentially secular values and beliefs expressed in the principles of liberty and equality and fraternity, for example, and that for that reason, 
um, expression of religion in public contexts needs to be controlled. And so the wearing of religious dress in certain public contexts or even in public schools and of religious symbols in those sorts of places uh, is prohibited and indeed more prohibited in a country like France compared to other liberal democracies where a more tolerant view of uh, public religious expression is accepted. Countries like Italy, for example, or the United States, for example, and indeed Australia, for example. Uh, so uh, it's certainly possible for a country to adopt increasingly restrictive secularist beliefs and to impose them on the citizenry in terms of public expression of religion. But it's also possible for a liberal democracy to be relatively more tolerant and to be less restrictive about uh, these matters. These are very complex questions and each country wrestles with these issues and adopts policies that um, place it at a different point on the spectrum of positions that can be taken uh, in relation to religious expression in the public sphere. You mentioned in your article that the notion of thou shalt have no other gods before me can just as much be demanded by a secular state as by a traditional God. How does this work and what are some examples that have affected religious Australians? Yeah, well, that, 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 that is very much like uh, or raises much of the sort of issues that I've, I've raised so far. Uh, because one of the things that Professor Fox points out is that um, in a totalitarian context, um, the state and its power um, takes on a quasi-religious uh, quality, even while at the same time, totalitarian states can be seen to be officially atheistic or intolerant of religion in the narrower sense of the word. It's like as if the religion of the state, perhaps, for example, the ideology of Marxist communism, for example, becomes a quasi-religion that is enforced by the state to the point of seeking to um, eradicate other contentious or alternative religions from um, public or even to an extent private life. Um, now, these sorts of things can uh, enter into Western liberal democracies on the edges of public policy. Perhaps one way of putting this is to Think about the whole concept of the establishment of religion. What does it mean to have a religious establishment or an established church, for example? Because the Australian Constitution in Section 116 says that the Commonwealth Parliament is not able to make a law for an establishment of a religion. And this reflects a con constitutional commitment to a certain kind of liberal democracy. But what exactly does it mean to establish a religion? The High Court of Australia has said that the establishment of a religion is to establish a particular church, a particular religious denomination as the official religion of the country and to specially support that religion by giving it privileges, by providing it with funding, by enabling it to establish its uh, religious buildings on public land, um, and all sorts of other privileges that might be given to that particular religion. And the High Court has said that Section 116 of the Australian Constitution prohibits the Commonwealth Parliament from making any law for that purpose. However, others have argued for a wider, more encompassing definition or interpretation of what it means to establish a religion, which would mean that governments are prohibited from providing any support for any organisation that happens to be religious, even if that support is non-discriminatory even if that support is given on the basis of entirely neutral criteria. For example, the funding of schools. Uh, the Commonwealth of Australia has provided financial support for private schools for a long time. 
But the basis of that support has always been uh, defined by reference to the need of the schools for support, the socioeconomic situation of parents and the educational needs that might exist and the facilities that schools need in order to provide education to children. And so this Commonwealth financial support is given to schools, private schools, whether or not they are religious and irrespective of the particular religion that they might, they might hold to. So in that sense, it's an entirely non-discriminatory policy, but it does involve taxation revenues being distributed to private schools, some of them secular and non-religious, others of them religious, and it means that the government is providing some sort of financial support to schools that are established for religious purposes. And there are those that would argue that that sort of funding is a form of uh, establishment of religion. However, the High Court of Australia in the landmark case that it decided on this point said that no, that is not an establishment of religion because it's not discriminatory. It's not favouring one religion over the other. It's not trying to support religion and not support non-religious schools. Rather, the support is given to all schools, whether religious or not. However, there is also an even more extreme view that is sometimes put, but has, to my knowledge, not seriously been argued before the courts, except in one uh, New South Wales case. But uh, this What's even stronger view says that when a member of parliament is debating a law, um, they should only take into consideration or publicly uh, state as reasons for the law, reasons that are secular, and they should never uh, draw attention to or argue from their religious convictions. Uh, and this is a very extreme view of what it would mean for a country to be a liberal democracy, because it would prevent people from uh, expressing their political views on the basis of their deepest political convictions. In a sense, it's an undemocratic uh, position to take because it doesn't let each individual form their political views and contribute to political debate in a way that genuinely reflects their own personal convictions. In fact, that sort of position has a tendency to uh, preference secular beliefs over religious beliefs, because it, if, if implemented, it would force everybody to reason in terms of non-religious thinking as opposed to religious thinking rather than allowing political debate to involve a contest of ideas and of arguments that can be based on all sorts of convictions and points of view. Uh, so when we ask in what ways is religious freedom potentially challenged in Australia and to what extent can secularism in that sense become not a way of maintaining neutrality amongst religions, but actually in a stronger sense, impose secularist values on our country and discriminate against those people that have religious convictions, it can happen in these two ways that I've mentioned, by attacks on the idea that the government can provide non-discriminatory support to, say, religious schools alongside non-religious schools, or even this even more extreme view that people should not be free to articulate their religious convictions when engaging in public debate, or parliamentarians can't do so when debating a particular law, for example. Uh, so that's where there is potential for a country like Australia to drift towards a secularist position, which seeks to exclude the use of religious beliefs and religious convictions in public discourse. As a professor of constitutional law, you would be well aware of several historical attempts to introduce a Bill of Rights to Australia. Can you take us through what a Bill of Rights would mean for religious freedom in Australia and the reasons why it has failed to be adopted here? 
Well, that's a complex question. Um, I think it's first important to distinguish between two ideas or concepts of what a Bill of Rights might be. And people will often use the word Bill of Rights and Charter of Rights to distinguish between the two types. Uh, partly because in Victoria, the ACT, and now in Queensland, um, we have state level bills of rights that are particularly in the Victorian and ACT context called charters of rights. Now, what these charters of rights do is that they require judges when they interpret legislation to interpret in a manner as far as is possible, consistent with the language of the legislation in a manner that preserves the human rights that are meant to be protected under the charter like the right to life and the right to not be discriminated against and due process of law and all of these other rights that are contained in the charters. But what the charters do not authorise the courts to do is to conclude that the law that has been passed by the parliament is invalid, unconstitutional and of no effect whatsoever because it interferes with the rights that are protected. The power of a court to determine that a law passed by the parliament is unconstitutional on the basis of a Bill of Rights is the second sense of Bill of Rights. It's the strong form of a Bill of Rights. It's the sort of Bill of Rights that exists in the United States, in Canada, in Germany, and in several other countries in the world. Those sorts of Bill of Rights give the courts the power to strike down laws as unconstitutional. Uh, that's different from the Charter of Rights model, which merely gives the courts the power to interpret the laws as much as they can in a way that protects human rights. But if a legislature passes a law which unambiguous, uh, unambiguously has a certain effect, and about which it's not possible to interpret it consistent with the language that's used in any other way than in the way that the legislature intended, then under the charters, the courts remain duty bound to implement the law and apply the law according to its terms. Now, uh, interestingly then, as I mentioned, three jurisdictions in Australia, Victoria, the ACT, and now Queensland, have adopted charters of rights in that particular sense of the word. But the other jurisdictions haven't. And notably New South Wales, which is our largest jurisdiction, our largest state in population, there's been strong resistance in the parliament, even indeed on both sides of politics, to the idea of introducing a charter of rights. The principal argument against a charter of rights, as well as a bill of rights, is that it still gives judges too much power, which is removed from the parliaments and means that through the democratic process, um, the people of the particular state are not in a position to elect governments and elect members of parliament who are able to debate policy and enact laws as a result of that entire electoral and parliamentary process. The other criticism of charters of rights and bills of rights is that it can have an effect on the judiciary themselves because an independent judiciary is a really important thing in a country because what it means is, is that the executive, by which we can mean not just the prime minister or the premier, but all of the uh, administrators who administer the law within the bureaucracy, including importantly, the police, are not in a position simply to decide that someone has broken the law and send them to jail or fine them or apply some other sanction to them. Rather, an independent judiciary means that the executive, the police or the Department of Public Prosecutions, have to convince an independent judge that, as a matter of fact, on the basis of evidence, a person has breached the law and that the sanction of the law should be applied to them. So the courts and our judges, as independent of the executive, play a very important role in preserving our freedoms, 
and ensuring that the law is applied only on its own terms and that the police and the Department of Public Prosecutions are not in a position simply to impose their will on us. Um, now, in order for the courts or the judges to perform this independent role, they need to be uh, able to uh, apply the law as it's written in a way that is non-politicised. And the risk in charters of rights and bills of rights is that it has a tendency to politicise the role of a judge in a very overt way, because the judge is called upon to scrutinise legislation to see whether it conforms to human rights. And within that process, judges have to weigh up the human right that's being affected by the law on one hand and the other purposes of the law that it's trying to achieve on the other and to see whether the interference with somebody's human right is justified. For example, most rights, uh, most charters of rights or bills of rights protect the right to freedom of speech. But does that mean that freedom of speech gives someone the right to defame people? to speak badly of people publicly when there's no reason to do so. No, we recognise in the law that defamation is something that is unlawful and for which people should receive compensation if they've been unlawfully defamed. And so we recognise that freedom of speech is not an absolute right, but must be balanced against the right to maintain your reputation and not be publicly defamed by someone without good justification. So when you have a Bill of Rights or a Charter of Rights, you call upon the courts to assess the law as to the balance between freedom of speech on one hand and personal reputation on the other. But that sort of a balancing act is the sort of judgments that have to be made by parliaments when they enact laws in the first place. It's a very controversial question about exactly how to balance these things. And when you get judges and courts engaged in the question of striking balances like that, they are placed into the position that is almost indistinguishable from a member of parliament deliberating over where the balance should lie. So that has the tendency to politicise the courts and their role. Now, that then undermines their capacity to act independently and to preserve the rule of law, in my opinion. Now, an obvious example of this is the United States Supreme Court, which has the power under the US Constitution, under the Bill of Rights in America, to decide that laws are unconstitutional because they interfere with, for example, freedom of speech, or because they interfere with um, people's bodily integrity. Um, and the law in relation to abortion, for example, in America, has been determined by the US Supreme Court, finding that all um, Americans have a right to privacy and that this right to privacy includes the right to control one's body, which includes a right to do with one's body whatever one wants, which includes the right to have an abortion. Now, that's a very political and controversial position to take in the United States. But the Bill of Rights gives that authority to the courts. So for that reason, in American politics, one of the most powerful political bodies in America is the United States Supreme Court. And so the power to appoint the judges to the Supreme Court, which is a power vested in the president, is an extraordinarily important power. And so presidential elections in America, as we've just seen, are in part deeply affected by the recognition that the president is in a position to appoint judges to the Supreme Court who will hold their positions for life if they want to, uh, and from that position be able to make most profound political judgments about what the law ought to be uh, in the United States. And so it politicizes the court and it thereby undermines its integrity and the respect that people have for it because the court takes a position on abortion or on political funding or on 
any one of a number of other controversial questions. And the people that agree with the court or the majority of the court are happy with its decision, but the people who disagree with the court are unhappy with the decision. And so it divides the population in their attitude to the court. And it means that the court is a highly politicised body that is subject to the sort of criticism that the president or members of Congress will be subject to because they are clearly engaged in politics and there are some people who support them and some people that oppose them. Once you politicise the court and the judges, you place them into a similar position where half the population likes them, half the, po the population abhors them. Politicises the role of the Supreme Court and makes it very difficult to uphold the rule of law in a way that is widely respected by both sides of politics and by the population generally. And this could prove to be really significant in the United States if any of these uh, challenges to the uh, election result uh, the, in the recent presidential election eventually get to the Supreme Court because it could be in the position to make a very significant decision. Uh, that has yet to be seen, of course, but in the year 2000, the Supreme Court was in the position to decide effectively who won the election in the Bush versus Gore case, which involved the electoral system in Florida and who won the election in Florida. So uh, this is part of the major reason why uh, bills of rights and charters of rights are controversial in Australia because we recognise that we want to maintain the integrity of our courts and the independence of the judiciary. And there's concern that if we uh, enact charters or bills of rights, it has a tendency over the long term. It doesn't happen straight away. It takes decades and decades, but it has a tendency to politicise the courts uh, and thus embroil them in political disputation. So there are these broad arguments around charters of rights and bills of rights. What are their relevance to the question of religious freedom? Because the First Amendment to the US Constitution, among other things, protects religious freedom. And in fact, the Australian Constitution contains a clause which says that the Commonwealth is not to make a law for the uh, interference of or the prohibition of the free exercise of religion. Um, that is a very significant provision. It's only just one provision in Australia, and that's why the High Court hasn't become generally politicised as it has in the United States, where they have an entire Bill of Rights. Um, now, these sorts of provisions, like Section 116 or the First Amendment to the US Constitution, can potentially have an impact on whether religious freedom is protected well in a country. But the point always is, is that it depends on the court and the judges as to the way in which they interpret a protection of freedom of religion. And one of the things about the First Amendment and Section 116 is that it is very, very general in its terms. It refers to freedom of religion. Now, in principle, most people who adhere to liberal democracy would say, yes, I agree with religious freedom and I think religious freedom should be protected. But when you dig down and ask questions, well, what does that mean specifically? How does it apply to particular circumstances? The sorts of situations we've been talk I've talked about a little while ago, talking about, say, government funding to private schools, including religious schools. Is that an establishment of religion? Or are they exercising their freedom of religion? People have different views about this. And so inevitably, when you give have a clause like this, in very, very general terms, it leaves it entirely open to the court and the judges to interpret it and apply it to any particular situation. And the provision itself, like section 116, doesn't in and of itself determine the outcome. For that reason, uh, it seems to me that um, it's probably preferable in most instances to protect religious freedom in a much more specific way, to address particular areas where religious freedom is at issue and questions of the establishment of religion are at issue, and to enact more specific legislation that in a detailed, 
and well refined way um, addresses the balancing questions about how religious freedom is to be protected and how other very important things like the prohibition on discrimination are to be maintained. And so the exceptions and the exemptions that exist in anti-discrimination laws are of this nature. Uh, at the beginning of the interview, um, I read to you um, some of the provisions in the Sex Discrimination Act, and you might remember that they're very detailed and complex and carefully crafted. This is to try to nail down very specifically the scope of their operation. And it seems to me that the way forward still is to persevere with very specific protections uh, that particularly balance the issues that are involved of protecting people from discrimination on one hand and maintaining uh, political and religious freedoms uh, on the other. Given your long-standing involvement in religious freedom issues, where do you think Australia is heading and what wisdom can you offer on how to reverse the trends of what you refer to as very real threats to religious freedom? It's difficult to know where Australia is headed. Um, interestingly enough, we've all gone through an unexpected COVID crisis, which has led the Australian federal government to put on the back burner uh, the, its plans to develop a religious discrimination law at a federal level. Uh, and so it's unclear what is going to eventuate as a result of that. The Attorney General seems to be taking a very careful approach uh, where he has released um, exposure drafts um, of the bill, received lots of uh, submissions and feedback and has revised that and, heard, and received more feedback and it's an ongoing process of determining the exact language with which religious freedom and discrimination norms are going to be balanced going forward in any federal religious discrimination act. And of course, there's a lot of political dispute um, from various sides and points of view about the exact balance that's to be maintained. And the difficult thing is to, uh, in terms of prediction, is that we don't know how the Attorney General himself will uh, view these debates and what direction he will take the legislation going forward. And then secondly, to enact the law, it has to be passed by the Senate. And so we don't know exactly what position the different parties in the Senate will, be, will take to this, whether they will require amendments to the legislation or not, and whether the government will be willing to accept any such uh, amendments. Uh, so I feel that, Rowan, is that um, the future of the protection of religious freedom in Australia is very, very uncertain. Uh, and I don't think it's very e easy to, to uh, predict its direction at all. Uh, as far as advice going forward, what I think is a, an unfortunate characteristic of a lot of the debate in this area is a tendency not to listen to each other. When one examines the arguments that, that are made in public discourse about exactly how to balance uh, non-discrimination norms on one hand against political or religious freedoms on the other, uh, one encounters arguments from various points of view that do not seem to take deeply into consideration the counter arguments that are being made by the other side. It's almost as if there are the, the uh, parabolic two ships in the, in the night that pass by each other and don't even know the other exists. Uh, there's a sort of independence of thinking, which is um, somewhat polarised in this debate. But if one thing came home to me during my time on the Ruddock panel is, is that what is needed is more dialogue between the points of view uh, to, to work through where the differences lie and where compromises might be able to be achieved in order to attain some degree of stability around the law. Because one of the difficulties in this area of law is not just the particular balance that's struck in any piece of legislation, but also just ambiguities about it or uncertainties about how it will be interpreted or the fact that the rules that exist in different jurisdictions are different. 
Um, so there's a lot of complexities uh, around the situation. And so one of the things that I think is needed is for people to be more carefully listening to each other in these debates that we're having. Professor Aroni, thank you very much indeed for being with us today on Talking Freely. It's been a pleasure, a real pleasure. That's it for our latest episode of Talking Freely. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can do so through our website, www.freedomforfaith.org.au. Freedom for Faith exists through the generous donations of individuals and organisations across Australia. If you'd like to financially partner with us, you can do so through our website.